Hi, welcome everybody this morning to our History of Everyone Else Teaching. My name is Nira. I'm Rihanna. And together we have set up this decolonial feminist historical education initiative now hosted on the Museum of British Colonialism. Every month we research a different moment in history um, that we were never taught in school. Um, come back to you and share with you what we've learned to explore not only um, you know what we've learned about British colonialism but also how history itself is taught. We're not history experts or researchers in the specific topic we talk about but believe strongly in making history accessible and in doing so unlocking history's potential to destabilize um, the colonial and especially civilizational narratives that we're grown up to believe are true. Do hit subscribe and follow us on Instagram where we share further resources and readings after this morning and also introduce yourself on the chat. We want to know who's with us and where you're joining from. Throughout the chat you can also share your thoughts um, and if you know anything about the topic we're talking about. Sometimes we invite activists, creatives and scholars to join us and share their knowledge. And today we are joined by a pseudo member of the collective who is often behind the scenes helping us out with the tech, but is today in front of the camera. Amea is doing a PhD at Columbia University on anti-fascist literature in Britain and Spain. And he is also a keen, a keen cricketer which is the topic of this morning's chat, cricket and colonialism. So to start us off, Amea, why are you interested in cricket? Hey, um, I mean, I played it a lot as a kid and I, I still play it. And um, I also, a lot of the, not the very first, but a lot of the first, many of the first books I was reading were cricket travel diaries, cricket biographies and autobiographies. Um, that my dad gave me, such as Sunny Days by Sunil Gavaskar. Um, so uh, that it was that kind of combination of things. My my brother teaching me to play when I was a kid in, in Singapore. But uh, it has also got a history, uh, history that's deeply related to colonialism. And uh, it's not sort of my, my specialist subject. Um, I, uh, I'm researching the Spanish Civil War, but there's a lot of uh, interrelationships between black history and, and uh, the Spanish Civil War. Um, and, you know, while researching for this podcast, for example, I found out that CLR James, who uh, wrote Beyond the Boundary, one of the major books on cricket, we'll probably talk about him a bit later. He used to look at a postcard of, of postcard print of the painting Guernica by Pablo Picasso and study it while he was at test matches, you know, uh, so. Okay, I guess Pablo <laughs> Picasso is in the Spanish Civil War, which we're not yeah. going to go too far. We're okay. going, but, in yeah. sense of it's, very, it's related to your research, but actually you're just more of a cricket enthusiast and, and a cricket player. Um, yeah. And so tell us a bit about it, you know, tell us a bit about where, where it actually came from. What is the history of the sport? Who actually invented cricket? Uh, well, the sort of prehistory of the sport is that it's a kind of chill, it was a, basically a children's game in the, in, uh, the medieval period and uh, into the 15 and 1600s, but it became a kind of more formal game for adults in the 1700s. It was part of the 18th century and 19th century creation of the idea of leisure. So as industrialization was happening in Britain, um, there was a need for many people to express how they spent their time, how they spent their, their, their leisure time. And at first, uh, it was also seen as a kind of revival of folk, um, kind of English culture. Um, maybe now is a good time I can sh share one or two slides um, about the growth of the game um, and uh, kind of where it took off. Um, so uh, we've got th here, there are some kind of early images of of English cricket. There's a William Blake poem that's from the early 1800s. And it's this idea of kind of like the village green as being very important. You've also got on the left someone standing really kind of upright in this kind of almost military style pose. Um, and that's kind of the early, early cricket in the 18th century. But then on this slide here, you've got the British Empire on the bottom left in 1901, which is the year that both 
Leary Constantine and CLR James were born. And those are the red countries in the British Empire. And then on the top right, the orange countries are, the, are you know, the full test playing nations. So you'll see a high degree of overlap between the red and the orange because the Brits um, exported cricket uh, as, a, as a major kind of colonial export in the 19th and 20th centuries. And so, so yeah. help us understand that a little bit. Why was it useful to the British to export the sport? How did it support that colonial project? Um, yeah, wh why is that map the way it is? Well, a lot of this at that, at that time is to do with the idea of the kind of imperial gentleman. Um, they'd establish a cricket club in the centre of a city um, that would be the place in which you could see the British espousing uh, fair play and the spirit of cricket. It was seen as a gentle kind of game played, um, you know, more by upper class people with the more and more the introduction of working class people. Um, and uh, it was played by amateurs, people amateur in the sense of people who love the sport, not people who were paid to play the sport mm -hmm. and who could conspicuously consume time, spend five days uh, playing, playing the sport. And so slowly trying to teach these values of, of Britain as a supposedly gentle and civil place, a place of manners. You know, manners were also a big, in the, in the late 18th century, uh, were very much growing in the culture as something to be, as something that was very British. And so th these are some of the ideas uh, not just in the major nations, but in, in, in uh, Hong Kong, which you've done an episode on, uh, the Hong Kong Cricket Club was seen as a place of fair play um, as well. So uh, that was, and, and that's often why you get phrases like, it's just not cricket and it's not in the spirit of the game. Um, something interesting about cricket, which is perhaps differentiates it from some other sports, is the extent to which you have to respect the umpire. The umpire makes a lot of calls and judgments about whether or not, and this is in the age before video cameras, about whether or not a batsman actually nicked the ball when it went, goes to slip, or if the ball hits a batsman's pad, whether or not it would have then gone on to hit the stumps. And you just have to respect the umpire, right? You're not supposed to be cheating or, uh, and so, uh, or whether or not when, the, when a catch is taken very close to the ground, if it's been taken cleanly or not. And these are all things, you know, you can have laws, but you also need to have a certain kind of spirit of agreement uh, over these kinds of uh, marginal calls. And so that's a big area in which the British, you know, saw themselves as, as good rulers uh, in, in, on the cricket field. Right. Is it fair to say at a very simplistic level that, you know, the Brits set the rules of what was fair and then anybody who, yeah, and then, and then, if you broke the rules, <laughs> you know, it, it was your fault. And that is a nice analogy for colonialism where, you know, they set the rules of wherever they were. Colonialism was a form of domination that was actually legal. It was actually very much, you know, official. Um, and then cricket also upheld that it was good for the people who were colonized. Is that too simplistic or is that a fair analogy? No, no, that, that is fair. And it's about the idea of tutelage or tutor, tutoring uh, the natives to get up to a point of civilization. That's very much kind of the way in which it was. Still. And, and when people today say cricket is a batsman's game, uh, you know, they, as I think we'll get on to, they're thinking about that idea of, uh, as in that image earlier of the batsman standing very upright, that's the kind of master, the wise figure. And then you've got other kinds of people putting their bodies on the line, fast bowling, breaking their bones, um, and kind of putting the energy in, in, into the game. So, so that's kind of some of the history of the kind of tutor and tutee relationship that's in, in cricket. Okay, so if that's, the, if that's the global picture, talk to us about the actual cricket team and how some of these ideas of you just mentioned already, who, who were the most skilled players um, and who, who were the less skilled players within a cricket team? And you may need to kind of explain a little bit about the, the, the game and what a batsman does and what a bowl, uh, bowler does. Yeah, well, unlike... Um... Unlike some some team sports, cricket is a sport in which 
there are players who are very highly skilled at one thing who might be terrible at another. So you can get a very highly skilled fast bowler who can bowl 90 miles an hour, but who could who would struggle if they were batting to defend themselves or a ball being bowled at 90 miles an hour. So you've got individuals in the team that are coming together with a very different set of skills. It's not, for example, like tennis, where you know, you've know you both got to have a relatively similar set of skills. Um, and what that meant, and, and bowling was, is tiring. Bowling takes a lot more energy, especially in a hot country, but anywhere. And uh, whether it was in kind of working class towns in the north of England or colonial subjects, they were the ones that tended to do the bulk of the bowling. Um, and by contrast, cricket writers tended to celebrate the stylishness and the elegance of batsmen. So it's almost like ballet or a kind of dance. And it's batsmen, they, they get this bowler putting in all this energy and then, you know, they just deflect the ball. It goes for a boundary and it, that's the, the batsman's artistry uh, and timing and touch that is uh, to be celebrated. Um, it starts to change in the 20th century, but very much it was the batsmen who were seen as uh, to, as the ones to be celebrated. Um, and, you know, the, the, the field was their canvas and the batsmen's shots were kind of painting strokes all around, uh, all around the, the field. Uh, that's very much how people thought about it in the, at the time. Yeah, and I, I, I think um, yesterday when we were kind of talking about this, we, through our research, because obviously I know a little bit about cricket, but not as much as you do having played it, I was really shocked to learn about how um, there was seg almost segregation within teams in the colonies so that you'd, um, as you say, this is a team of like 11 players, I believe, but mm -hmm. there's a hierarchy in that team. If you are the batsman or like this certain level, it's seen as the brains. That's what mm -hmm. I read. But then, and in other positions such as in fielding or whatever is like the brawns and it was racially segregated within the teams. Like, could you talk about what that means in a colony such as Trinidad or Jamaica? Yeah. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it's even today, it's very rare for a bowler to be a captain. The, 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 you know, the theory is that running or spr sprinting around in the field, running around is exhausting work. Whereas by contrast, the batsman's a bit more like a boxer. They get on their front foot, their back foot, but they're thinking about where to place the ball in the field. Um, they've obviously uh, not bowling, so they've got a lot of time off to rest and think. Um, and so they very much are seen as the analytical brains trust behind the team. And they're often standing in slip the positions just to the right of the wicketkeeper. And they're the ones doing all of the discussion. And, uh, and in sort of the West Indies context in the early 1900s, you know, in one of the very first West Indian tours to Britain, uh, there were only five black players that were taken on that tour. The, the majority of the players were white. And it tended to be in, generally in the colonial context that uh, those that were not white did the, the hard work of actually bowling. Um, and you can see this even in, you know, kids games between two kids on the street. There's the kid who won't, who, who won't go out when they've been, when they've been given out. And there's always the kid who's just pleading for one more ball and one more ball. Um, and those are the, the Rajas of, uh, of cricket. That's the, that's that's who the batsmen are in the, that context, and so to be well, we can tell talk about a bit about how Constantine changes that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like so. I guess part of this is that we yeah, we've set the scene of this game, this cricket that is um, being exported across the colonies, but it's like also a deeply hierarchical game. And then there are people like Leary Constantine who. Um, I was shocked to know that I had not heard of this man before we started researching for this episode, and I'm. Com Confused about why, because he is actually such an epic uh, character in history to learn about, and he was basically one of the one of the greatest cricketers of all time and a political activist. So, like, maybe could you bring us back to the beginning? Who was he? Where was he born? Um, who was his family? I know you have some clips of his voice as well that we can listen to. Who was this man? Yeah, yeah, we'll get to. Um why him being an all-rounder changed things. But before that, I'm just going to give a little bit of uh, biography of Leary. Um, and uh, Leary was the, himself the son of a, a famous uh, cricketer, um, LeBron Constantine. Um, and they, uh, uh, Leary was the grandson 
of an enslaved person and his grandfather was a slave as well. So here's just a little clip, I hope, I have, let me know if it doesn't work, um, of him talking about his, his childhood. My grandparents were slaves. It's queer now to think back to my childhood, to see my grandfather sitting in the hot sunshine on the top step of his little bungalow, leaning his back against the door and to realize that when he was a youth, he was a slave. And my grandmother, too. Leary Constantine's own father. So, yeah. Um, the, uh, Leary Constantine was born in, in 1901. His father was um, an overseer on a coca plantation. Um, and his father had really struggled to make money playing cricket. So he was very much pushing Leary to not be a cricketer and wanted him to work in... Uh, various kind of, I think it's oil and gas kind of companies uh, in Trinidad. And, um, you know, Leary kept on pushing and pushing and eventually was allowed to play cricket. And they they show the very rare record of being a father and son to play a first class match together um, because his father, while 48, was still fit enough to be playing at a, at a high standard of cricket. Um, and... Um, he played for Shannon, which is the same cricket club that CLR James played for, a historic cricket club in Trinidad. Um, and by the 20s, was starting to get noticed and went to England, um, paid very little to be there as a West Indian cricketer under a white captain um, and saw England as his audition to get a job as a league lancashire league cricketer so that was that was where the money was in the lancashire leagues so when he arrived in england in 1928 yes he was playing for this confederation of cricket nations known as the west indies but that's very much what he would well um, as well as you know um trinidadian and Car caribbean pride he was trying to actually get a job uh, a job as a cricketer um so that's kind of a little bit of the bio. Are there any other things you wanted to know about his early? Yeah, I, well, maybe, I yeah, think yeah. from my reading as well, I was curious about the place that he arrived at. So he arrives in the UK at what, around like the 1920s, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And nice arrives at this town called Nelson in Lancashire, which is a very small um, northern town and a very a cotton, a cotton town. And it's very clear, like when you read about it, that he was potentially literally the first black person who's like ever arrived in this town um and he received a huge amount of racism nelson people didn't know what to do with him who was this guy um but also if you read about it like nelson and these areas were deeply involved with like producing cotton which of course the cotton where was it coming from in the last hundreds of years um is yeah is coming from in the slavery, the South of America. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, places like Nelson have a deep kind of black history involved. It's just that Leary happened to be the first one to actually turn up on this place and almost changed their opinion of him because he came, became a huge local hero due to his like incredible cricketing skills. Um, Amira, I think you brought up like a nice point yesterday when we were talking about the South and what does the South mean? In yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, there's something really interesting about how, and, and we're going to come on to this when we talk about Leary, the racial justice activist, but you know, the way that racism in America has a specific form because the deep South is within that within that territory. Whereas you could you could really make the case that the deep south for the UK and Britain is the Caribbean and is the West Indies. Um, but you know that and that has real implications for kind of the type of racism that's here. And you know, I I, I have to I have to just um, just point out the context that we're talking in today where you know we do have a government right now that is very explicitly, you know, denying any institutional racism in the UK and calling us, you know, the poster child for a post-racial mm -hmm. society and very deliberately not, uh, not promoting colonial histories to be taught. And so the idea, I just, you know, there's very strong links about, about who wants these stories to be known and told and that cartography of where our deep South is. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, but actually, we, we have a clip yeah. of Leary talking about arriving yeah, in let's Nelson. Listen to him. Yeah, let's play, uh, let's play that, and then I'll say a little bit more about, um, about Nelson and his time there. And adults didn't behave much better. The white man had not been used to a black man in his midst, competing on terms of equality with him on the cricket field. Making runs and being cheered, I got anonymous letters from time to time saying that you can't play cricket for toffee. Why don't you go back to your country? Time after time these letters came and my heart was almost broken. But my wife, I want to pay her this tribute, said let us turn round and fight Leary. So I played for Nelson for nine years, won the championship on seven occasions and were runners up on the other two. I became pretty popular, though I say it myself. But when the second world... So yeah, that was, uh, that was his time there. And you know, there's no need to, um, to demonize Nel the, pe the people of Nelson. Uh, actually, if you didn't have to go very far to Liverpool to find a major black population, historic population in terms of um, it's Liverpool's own relationship to slavery. But uh, conditions were so deprived in the late 20s and early 30s, you know, with the Great Depression, that you could easily be born a kid of a minor in a town like Nelson and never have seen the sea, you know, even if Liverpool was not that far away. So over those nine years, Leary became an absolute hero. Um, and there are, there are examples in the 19th century as well, but there are examples later of uh, solidarity, really, between um, people in Lancashire and black communities. And oh, really? <laughs> go on. I was just going to say because I um I wondered whether I know you have some photos of Leary and maybe you could show us some photos whilst telling us about what was distinctive about his cricketing style because I know we were talking about yeah. um this idea of England and the straight lines and how you know the perfection of this game and how Leary had his own kind of style during these kind of epic years of him being a cricketer. But I think it might be nice to see some visuals of him as well. Sure. Um, and, you know, uh, as a as a literature student, this is kind of the thing that I enjoy. Um, but uh, this is an early kind of example um, of uh, cricketing textbooks. You get the, the kind of very literal metaphor of, um, oh, he's play, played textbook um, about people. Um, uh, here's someone playing in supposedly the correct way um, in a very static kind of shot this is supposedly a totally incorrect way of playing an off drive it's all about having in the first one having like a very high elbow and your head over the ball but also your foot right by the ball and um yeah it's it, it, there is a theory of the body and the way that the body mo moves in a particularly rigid kind of way that's implicit in some of these photos um as you can see at the top there's great this is all from anthony bateman's but cricket literature and culture at the top of the great caption, style is a great deal, if not everything, which is not something that would you'd say about necessarily all sports. Um, and on the bottom right, you've got um, uh, Dulip Sinji there, an early Indian cricketer. Um, but one the innovations which some of the Australians and Indians were bringing into the game were that they were doing things stylistically differently. But even now, if you kind of are being coached in a village club in England today, it's very likely a coach would would be pleased if they see you doing what the person on the bottom left is doing with the elbow kind of ready to swing like a pendulum in a straight line through the ball. Um, by contrast, this is the finish of one of Leary Constantine's shots. Um, there's a lot more wrist work. It's a bit more like some something that you might see in uh, Mahendra Singh Dhoni today. Uh, and uh, here you've, that, that's a lovely photo on the left, but on, on the right hand side, the, pay attention to the caption there, half cut, half drive and holy Constantine. So in the cricket textbooks, you're taught that the cut shot is a shot you play, a horizontal shot you play on the back foot. And the, the drive is a front foot shot you play vertically. And here he's playing a diagonal shot, um, you know, with his weight kind of a little bit in between. He's gone on the front foot a little bit. Um, and this is from his own, uh, his own book on, his first book on cricket, Cricket and I, uh, which was one of the first books by Caribbean authors to be published in the UK and ghost written by CLR James, who was his lodger at the time. Um, and uh, okay, here's a little bit more on cricket style. Um, 
let's just what hopefully this clip will play it's a silent film um and uh if this is from about 1928 and if we go to take it a little bit further um this is this is leary running into bowl bowling just as a modern bowler would very fast you know nice high jump very athletic action he's wearing a hat which is quite quite odd but people did in the in in that day that might seem normal now that kind of very athletic way of playing but actually at the time that was not not the norm at all and it was seen as um kind of using energy in a way which was somewhat inelegant um and uh i'm just going to redo these quotes since i seem to have blocked them blocked them off slightly um but uh oh, i'll try again now That's... yeah you can see them now but um Neville Cardus, who was one of the major cricket writers, um, describes him in what you would call a kind of primitivist way, the way that Picasso would paint uh, black people. Um, in the top right, he's, he's being Constantine is being described as an elemental instinctive force. He's, he's got swift darts and twistings. He batted with a racial power. Um, and apparently he stands in for all West Indian cricketers, right? As every West Indian boy determined, is determined to bat, as every West Indian wants to bowl. And what you've got on the bottom right is CLR James starting to contest this colonial way of describing the aesthetic way in which Leary Constantine plays. Um, and so at the, at the bottom of that quote there, you've got, it wasn't due to his marvelous West Indian eyes and wrists, it was due to his marvelous brains. Um, and this is why it's so important to think about Constantine as a all-rounder, because whereas earlier um, it was very much that colonial subjects were the ones that were doing the bowling, uh, Constantine was clearly able to do both. It was relatively hard if you were just a batsman and not white to get picked into the West Indies side. So um, that's, that's what Constantine was, was able to do. And in so doing, he was kind of challenging that textbook rectilinear way of playing. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there on the aesthetic, the, but there was a politics to the aesthetic way in which he played. Really interesting. Um, and it was really cool to see that clip of uh, Constantine playing as well. The, I'm, Clearly, you know, cl clearly, like you were saying, the racial power that he described, the way that this sport was exported to the colonies, you know, it's heavily, it's heavily embedded in kind of the colonial project of, of white supremacy and, and civilizational narrative. And, you know, we could at this point talk about how colonized populations used cricket to, you know, beat the colonizers at their own game. And there are these magnificent stories of, you know, the West Indies cricket team led by Frank Worrell beating England at Lord's Cricket Ground and the symbolic significance of that in an anti-colonial context. Um, what I think we're gonna do though now is in the last 10 minutes talk a little bit more about Leary's later life um, because, you know, me included, I, I didn't think that sports or cricket were that political before researching for this episode. I kind of understand the colonial narrative, but I was really surprised to learn about Leary as a racial justice activist. Um, and so can you tell us a bit, like what did Leary do after cricket? Yeah, so um, it's funny that people are so insistent even today on the idea that sports and politics don't mix. Actually, in the Second World War, the British government asked Leary to play in charity matches. So he's, you know, he's just retired, still pretty fit, um, to get support for the Commonwealth because the, the, the British forces needed loads of troops from uh, their colonial possessions to fight in World War II. So it was a very political use of, him, of sport, him being there. They also asked him to work in the Ministry of Welfare um, and I can show uh, a little slide of him. Uh, and they put out a silent documentary about how 
uh, that they sent to the Caribbean about him as a welfare worker and cricketer. Here he is with workers who've come from the West Indies to work on munitions um, taken from Merseyside, which is heavily bombed further in inland, um, and you know trying to pioneer um, forms of kind of assimilation or positive race relations in Britain. Um, so that was what he was doing during the war. Um, he was basically a civil servant and an agent of the British state. Um, so he was very shocked when in 1944, he showed up to the Imperial Hotel in Russell Square in London, only to be told that he couldn't stay at the hotel. So I'm just gonna play a quick clip of that, of him describing his experience. Um, because it's quite relevant. Time. I had a receipt in my pocket, and when we arrived, they accepted the English section of our party and rejected the coloured section. And although we had booked the rooms for all, told me they were full up and so on, and I produced my receipt and they made excuses. But eventually we had to leave the hotel. And in order to set the example, that the law wouldn't discriminate. I took action against the hotel. So what did he decide to do? He fought in this legal case. He himself was training to be a barrister at the time. Um, he had the support of many uh, civil servants and people in parliament. Um, and uh, he won the case, and the case became a precedent for cases to do with the colour bar and legal discrimination in the UK, and it was, was kind of seen as a pioneering legal precedent for the Race Relations Act in 1965. So that was, he both worked for the state in the 1940s, but was quick um, to work against the Imperial Hotel in this case. Um, maybe, yeah. Can I, also, can you maybe take off the slides so we can come back to yeah. ourselves? And yeah, I just want to like, like pause for a moment on it because I think the Imperial Hotel, like Leary versus the Imperial Hotel part uh, really struck me because I'd never heard of this color bar thing happening in the UK before this idea that a hotel literally, he turned up with, um, he turned up and they said, actually you can't come in because of your color. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I also found interesting is, um, Basically, yeah, at the hotel at the time, there was like over a hundred American American delegates at this hotel who, mm. and the hotel made a call that given segregation in America, this was still the fifties, all of that, it was gonna make the Americans feel uncomfortable um, if Leary stayed there. And even back in Nelson, I remember listening about Leary talking about how there was the kind of daily racism from the English. And then when the Americans came and brought even more ideas of segregation and deeper stuff, that really annoyed Leary. And he's both like fighting against the British, but also sometimes saying that this isn't the British way of doing this. We do fair play and like fighting the Imperial Hotel on that front. Um, but yeah, I think it's this, I think this color bar thing idea that it really happened in the UK, not just America, but more at the discretion of all, any business that wanted to do it and wanted to black, uh, block black people from entering their spaces and Asian mm. people, I'm sure as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Mira, do, were you going to jump in? Um, actually, on a very similar point, you know, yeah. that what really struck me about this story was, yes, you know, uh, a, a black cricketer is able to to, uh, to to beat, you know, to beat the white English at cricket. Um, and in that way, yeah, disrupt ideas of, of, of skill and brains. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, he, he lived in Lancashire for nine years and then worked for the British state and spent so much time and devoted a lot of his life to, yeah, being inside, but friendly critical of the British state, you know, for the rest mm -hmm. of his life. And, and very critical, you know, outspoken about the Queen, um, outspoken about the colour bar, fought, uh, fought fiercely in the courtroom against the Imperial Hotel and also in the Bristol bus boycott in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So a very fierce campaigner who 
you know, but was very much within the British state and and uh, ended up being a peer in the House of Lords. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it really does. It, it, it changes the idea of colonialism and anti-colonialism being these nations, um, you know, against Britain, which which I think comes up a lot in in our conversations, but really came across very powerfully in the life and story of Leary Constantine. Mm. And then I just wanted more on like a personal level to, because I think we've heard about um, Amaya's, yeah, relationship to cricket. And I just feel like if you're from families that were, you know, previously colonized or, you know, from these kind of things, like cricket just comes up so much. Even yesterday I was interviewing um, an 80 year old man from St. Vincent and all he could talk about was his cricket team um when he came to England and they were, really wanted him to play in the cricket team at the factory that, at the bus garage he was working mm -hmm. as a bus conductor and I have family members who play cricket Mira I don't know whether cricket is part of your world as well at all. not too much no. <laughs> but you know my my brother Rasul did play cricket and um I've, I've gone to watch a game but I, I do have to say you know it, it's so male it's 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 very yeah. very it's very much a male sport and that those gender norms are again very much part and parcel of this colonial history of of you know who who is human enough to to play the game in a racial way and then also in a gendered way but we did I did for a moment watch women's cricket um, and it was you know it was so powerful. It was really mesmerizing to watch women play cricket. And it, mm. it just brought home to me how much it is tied up with, with gender. But, mm. um, and, you know, I played quick cricket here and there and I've really enjoyed it. And it's maybe something that I want to explore doing a bit more of. Yeah, nice. Um, well, I feel like we are kind of rounding up and I think it, it's, I've been really appreciative, yeah, for Amea to like, for you bringing this person and this kind of history like to just even my own knowledge lens like learning about I would really recommend people if you're interested listen to the full podcast with you know with, to listen to Leary's voices and like read more about him read more about um sports in the British Empire and um I think yeah cricket is a particularly interesting one just because it's so long they have these different you know the different hierarchies the racialized segregation of the teams and stuff um, but also you can tell there's just the, the strong love of cricket, even from yourself, Amaya. And it's not like we're here to be like, oh, these sports are terrible and no one should ever play them because of the colonial past. But how do you both love something, be, be so brilliant at it in the same way that Leary was, but also like, as you say, play the British at their own game better in your own style. Um, and I, and um, it's, a, yeah, where's, where's my little poem? while you're getting that up I, I want to quickly just bring in that Roland Alube is saying to you Rihanna that your cricket is... playing family are listening <laughs> oh, you know, it's very much part fine of I will name history. I will name it I will name it my <laughs> uncle is an exceptional cricket player <laughs> um I just want to just maybe while you're getting up I just want to fill in a little bit of the story about uh about the, the the West Indian side for, for Leary, because yes, he ascended through the, the British establishment, was the first black peer in the House of Lords, was the governor on the BBC. But at the same time, as as he was kind of part of it, as happens with some, some people in diaspora, he was also negotiating his relationship with Trinidad as Trinidad in the 30s, as Trinidad was going through various strike waves, and then in the 50s during independence. So he was not only a politician in Britain, he was appointed as a politician in uh, Trinidad. Um, and I'm just going to share just a couple of um, of the, the titles from uh, the period. So you've got Cricket and I in the 30s, Colour Bar in 54, and CLR James's own book. But uh, this really came to a head with the West Indian bus boycott, where he eventually resigned in protest from his position in the West Indies in protest because the West Indian, because the Trinidadian Prime Minister was saying that sports and politics should not mix. Um, so here we've got a, a poster from the 1930s of the Transport and Workers General uh, a Union trying to borrow the rhetoric of cricket as the sport in which you're very tough. Um, you know, they've got wages, hours and conditions on the wicket. Then in the 50s, you've got the Bristol bus boycott where there is again a colour bar linking it to earlier with the Imperial Hotel 
where the bus companies and the transport workers general union are saying we won't hire uh, Caribbean workers in Bristol. Um, and uh, you've got Leary here on the right hand side. But the, the key bit that I kind of just want to bring out is that it again gets to this question of whether or not sports and politics sh should or should not mix. So Frank Wall was the captain in 1963. The West Indies were playing in Gloucestershire and Leary tried to get them to call off the match. Many people did. And under intense pressure, they didn't call off the match. But that didn't mean that, that sports and politics were successfully kept separate mm -hmm. because what did people do? They went around the cricket ground handing out leaflets and pamphlets about the Bristol bus boycott and when the West Indies beat Gloucestershire in that match it was celebrated as a political kind of victory so uh, he has a very complicated history I'll leave it there with yeah. both his relationship with Britain and Trinidad um, which uh, I, I mean maybe we'll talk more about the Bristol he was a minor figure in the Bristol bus boycott but maybe we'll talk about him that bus boycott in a, in a different episode yeah and um, yeah I think Bristol bus boycott requires its own episodes for us to really get into what this what this even was but yeah I just found um, a quote from a poem that maybe we can end on um, Mira can you read it <laughs> sure sure um, yeah this poem reads Prospero batting, Caliban bowling, and his cricket is cricket in your rickets, but from afar it looked like politics. And I think yeah. Rihanna and I really liked this because it was it very much encapsulated our theme of, of, of cricket when you're close, but zooming out so political um, and with such an interesting story to tell. Um, yeah. Thank you all for your comments in the YouTube channel. I can see lots of chat about learning about the colour bar. Um, and Lucy, you know, I was just as kind of surprised as you were. Rihanna, there's, um, there's, a, there's a Michael Collins who's writing a pro research project on Caribbean cricket in England mm -hmm. and would really like to talk to you about, you know, uh, the awesome. interview you had and, and you know, the, the idea of your elderly, relative, um, mm. you know, interview playing cricket at the Basque is, is so relevant. So thank you all for sharing your, your comments um, and, and thank Please, you for joining yeah. us. Our, our social media stuff is in the bio. Please follow us. We'll put the poem out as well online as well on different resources. Thank you, Amea, for joining us. And we'll be back next month with a new episode on a different part of history. We'll let you know exactly when we have decided what it's going to be. So thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.